No, I can do it. No, I have no idea. Sleep during the day. I can't sleep during the day. I'm getting my movie, my house. I'm moving. Okay. Okay. Um, welcome to Faith Clinic, everyone. Those in house and uh, those joining us online and uh, uh, phone conference, welcome you. I uh, want to uh, thank Reverend for this opportunity again. Now let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight that we've gathered once again in your name. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, you are here with us. I pray, Lord, that you would open our understanding, that you would teach us your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak and give us revelation and insight and understanding. In the name of Jesus, that we will receive it and will apply it in our lives. We thank you for those who are watching and those who watch later. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to continue from last week. We're talking about the sign of the last days. And I'm going to do a quick refresher and uh, add some new things and make some correction where I missed it or say something correct last time. So we were in the book of Mark chapter 13, that's where we started. And uh, we read from verse 1 to 6, and I'll start from there again. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them again began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Amen. And so that's where we stopped. And we said last time that the sign that Jesus gave for the last days, and for the things that the disciples were asking was, take heed so that no man will deceive you. So of all the signs in the last days, it all boils down to being deceived, deception. Deception will be rampant. In fact, so much so that the Bible says, if possible, even the elect can be deceived. That means that if you, you, you cannot uh, depart from the faith if you are not deceived. Deception opens the doorway for us departing from the faith. And so the key sign is deception. And I was saying that all the different uh, signs that Jesus gave, as we will discuss, it's really a different manifestation of deception in the different arena. Now, he mentioned in the church, but also in the world. He can talk about deception in the political arena, in the world affairs. And then you can see how that can be used with the things going on with nature, with changes in the atmosphere how all that ties into deception. So the main sign for the last days is deception. And that deception manifests in different forms, depending on where you are. And we said in the church, primarily, Jesus was talking about those who will come in his name. But before we got to that, we looked at characteristics of someone that can be easily deceived. 
you know, why would people get deceived? What are things you can watch out to say, okay, the person who has this is a candidate for deception. And we talked about incomplete knowledge, people who have incomplete knowledge, incomplete knowledge of scripture. You see, that is how sin came in the first place. Because Eve had incomplete knowledge. You know, uh, one of my one of my mentors says that the most dangerous thing is mixture because mixture has a little bit of the truth but it's not the truth that it has that is deadly it's the other part of it that is mixed with falsehood and lies is what makes it more deadly and so sin came into the world because Eve had incomplete knowledge either she had incomplete knowledge or his, her husband didn't do a good enough job of explaining to her the things that God told him. And so because he had incomplete knowledge, the devil seized on that. And so whenever we have incomplete knowledge, it opens the door for the enemy to provide things and to cause us to begin to doubt, to doubt God. The Bible says we use the Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 where it was God who said that my people perish for lack of knowledge. They don't have knowledge of who I am. You know, and we say that incomplete knowledge could also be, you know, the Bible says we are to grow in grace and in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So if your knowledge of the Lord Jesus, if you're not growing in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus, then you become stagnant. And if you become stagnant over time, you have incomplete knowledge of the Lord. Because the Lord is always progressive in revealing who he is. Think of it. The people of Israel were in Egypt, but they were moving from in, uh, in the wilderness and they were moving from place to place. If the Lord said move and you don't move, then you become um, delinquent. You become old and you die because the Lord moves. And it's the same way with us. If the knowledge of the Lord the Bible says that you have to be full of the glory of the Lord, of knowledge of so if the Lord, if the Lord has shifted in his knowledge in the present revelation of the Lord, and we're still in the old place, we could die, we could suffer for it. And so we're to grow in complete knowledge. And then the other one we talked about was people who reject knowledge, you know. You can have incomplete knowledge, but then you can also reject knowledge. It's not that... Now, there are many reasons why people might reject knowledge. They, they have knowledge, but then when knowledge increased, they rejected the new knowledge instead of growing and accepting it and advancing and moving on with the Lord. They rejected it and because they rejected it, they ended up not moving on. And we can see this in Romans chapter 1 verse 28, we use that as an example <coughs> where he was the Apostle Paul who was writing. Romans 1.28 says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So, when people refuse to acknowledge the Lord, they refuse the knowledge of the Lord, then the Lord turns them over to a mindset that is contrary to the Lord. And then we mentioned 
in verse 32, where he talked about who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So it's not just those who see or take pleasure in doing things that God hates, but those who are lukewarm, who agree to it. Of those who say, say they have pleasure in them that do it. So you don't want to offend those who are doing things that God hate because you don't want to be seen as being a hate you hate or No, but you don't, you're lukewarm, you're not on God. But you're not on the enemy side, you're in the middle. You reject knowledge of God. Now, Church history is full of this. You know, I uh, I was wrong here because last time I talked about Martin Luther. I mean, uh, and I I said I was using him in terms of baptism, but that wasn't correct because Martin Luther was talking about salvation by faith. You know, and so that's where he's coming salvation is by faith not by, by doing things that the Catholic Church were telling people to do and he got in trouble for that but that was a revelation but a big revelation that the Lord Gave him that Oshadi most people who, who camp on that When the Lord had said, another knowledge of him, like John Wesley came in preaching holiness. Some people stayed in the holiness camp and then they didn't move on. Right? And then later on, they had water baptism. And some people stayed with water baptism. Whereas what the Lord is doing is slowly bringing revelation of who he is to the body of Christ. So we have full knowledge. And what we have to do is to receive the new revelation and then grow with it. It's like when you go from primary one to primary two or grade school, when you move to a, a, a higher grade, you don't reject, for, forsake, or forget the old things you learn. The old things become the foundation for the new things. So the revelation of the Lord, the Lord is giving us becomes a foundation for new revelation so we can have full revelation and why this is really tragic and very important for us is take for example whenever God is releasing revival and there is a new move of God the people that reject the new move of God were those who experienced the previous move of God and most times People who pray for revival, when God begins to answer them and to send the revival that they prayed for, they end up rejecting the revival they prayed for because it didn't come in the form that they expected. And so they tend to judge the new move of God by the old move of God and say the old move of God was like this and they don't allow themselves to participate in the things that they labeled themselves. 
And this is really important because we are at the time where God is releasing a new move. And the mistake is many people will say this is how you judge a revival. But the Lord says, I'm doing a new thing. Forsake the old things. Because God is, no, we don't know God, all of us, we don't, because God is God. <laughs> and I say for eternity, we're going to be learning about who He is. So who are we to say what God is doing today is only God if He follows the same pattern as the previous things that God did. And so we need to be careful that we don't reject knowledge of God because he is doing something new that we didn't see before. Now, there's this man of God, Bob Jones. Prophet Bob Jones was the father of the prophet. And he said that uh, when Toronto revival happened, I have some people who always are very negative against the Toronto revival. And they said, you know, there was a lot of things that happened there that wasn't God. And then because of that, they reject everything that happened in Toronto. But Bob Jones was a big prophet of God who's going to be with the Lord. And he said that the Lord told him, I'm doing a new thing in Toronto. About 20% of it is more, will be me. But that's more than you've seen in your lifetime. You need to go and, and take a and be part of it. And so this is a, a man of God. The Lord told him, I'm doing a new thing. About 20% of that, the manifestation should be me. That means that 80% is what most people are focusing on, but they're missing what the Lord is doing. And then, they, if it's like my wife, uh, she had this saying, throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? That's what we do, because whenever God is doing a new thing, the devil will look for a way to counterfeit it. If he can't counterfeit it, then he tries to come in and join and try to uh, destroy it from within. And so it requires discernment to know. But because it's new, it's new for everybody. So you don't know how to judge it. You might say this manifestation is not from God, but unless the Holy Spirit really tells you, there is no way to know. So when new things are happening, new revivals are happening, it's kind of messy because we're all learning. But most people focus on the things that are not, well, we don't know it's, it's not God, but the things that look very questionable and they reject everything else. And so, by doing that, we reject what God is. It's like what just happened uh, this fall in the revival that happened at uh, uh, Asbury, right? There was so much confusion. Some people say this revival, some people went there, they say it's not revival, it's not like our revival in the past, right? But there were lives that were transformed and changed. People were on fire for God. But because it didn't follow the pattern that we know, some people totally rejected it. So when we reject what God is doing, we reject God. And that's how many people miss out because they have this, God has to be this way. And so many people reject knowledge of God, sometimes out of pride. And because they do that, they don't join and experience the new move of God. Think of when Jesus came. The Pharisees knew Jesus was coming. They even told Herod where he was going to be born. But when Jesus came, they were the one that did what? Ended up crucifying him. Because he didn't come in the way we expect. And we judge them harshly, but we do the same thing. <laughs> because what new, the new things God is doing is new to all of us. And what it requires is humility. So that we don't fall. It's like they caught Jesus saying he was doing things by Bezobah because they weren't discerning. And so we need a little bit of humility and discernment. We need humility so we don't reject what the Lord is doing. Amen. And then listening to false teachers. People that listen to false teachers, in 1 Timothy, 
1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 2 to 3. This is Paul. Now the Spirit expressly speaks that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of demons. So if people are departing from the faith, it's because they're listening to something that seems like it's true, but they don't know that it's not true. And so they're listening to a false spirit. And then they're being led astray. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hot iron. And that's the worst thing, because then once people are deceived, they believe that, and their conscience can be seared with hot iron, so they can never receive the truth. Now, we talked about the Berean church. This was Paul. Paul was saying that even after he finished teaching them, they went and searched to make sure that what Paul taught was biblical, was true. Now we have some denomination or religious organization where the leader is, is you can't question the leader. It's like they will say the Pope is, uh, what's the word, infallible. The Pope is a human being, it's not infallible. God's word is infallible. And so most people say you can't question the Pope, right? That means if you can't question the Pope or if you can't question the teacher, if the teacher is wrong because you put so much trust on the person instead of the word of God, you can become deceived. Now, this is very important because, you know, the Antichrist cannot have legitimacy unless the church endorses the Antichrist. The church will endorse the Antichrist, thereby giving the Antichrist legitimacy. So, the Antichrist, yes. Well, it doesn't matter if whichever religious organization, but the church, not just the Catholic, even the Pentecostal, the Charismatic, the church, religious leaders who endorse the Antichrist, they're already doing it right now, they're forming one more religion. And we have Pentecostal leaders who met with the Pope, right, and many years ago, and when whether they knew it or not, that's where it was going. So, and the Antichrist will need a false prophet in order to legitimize him. And the false prophet will do the bidding of getting religious leaders from every religious to em em endorse him. So, the Antichrist cannot fully take his position without some church leaders endorsing him. Now, if you do not become a Berean Christian who not only know the word, but pay attention to who you're listening to and make sure that they're not teaching you falsehood, then you're going to follow them or whatever he or she is speaking and you're going to be led astray. Now, let's look at um, Revelation chapter 12. Let me give you, this is talking about the end time, so you can see how this is going to happen. So next time when you're listening to someone, don't just take in everything. Listen with one hand, with one ear to what they're saying and compare it with scripture and receive it if it agrees with scripture, even if it's your favorite teacher, even if it's, even if I say something, guys sit down, that's not scriptural. Then I, if always point it out, then I will uh, correct myself. And many times, when I say something, I like to listen to what I, or the recording, because then I, I listen to it and oops. Or sometimes, after teaching, as I'm going around, the Lord will begin to expand some things. And then I begin, oh, I was wrong. I have to correct it. Because we're all growing. And I remember this man of God, uh, Richard Rembrandt. I don't know, he was the man of God that was tortured in the Soviet Union and had gone to be with God. 
And he said that many times you need to preach one message ten times in order to get it correct. So after ten times, then you will receive all the revelation. So preaching it once is not enough, because then as you preach it, the revelation increases. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, listen to this. He says, he's talking about the dragon through the tenth part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, my focus is on the first part that the dragon, using his tail, drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Now, who are the stars of heaven? Because he drew them and cast them to the earth. Now, this is where we need some interpretation of what the stars of heaven is. Let's look at Daniel chapter 12. So we can see, and then we look at Matthew chapter 14. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Who are the stars of heaven? In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, this is what it says. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So who are the stars? Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. That's us. Yes. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So the stars are believers. Those who are wise, who are in position where they can influence others, who are in position where they can lead many to righteousness. So, when these individuals who were in influential position, they started off well with the Lord. A false teacher doesn't just become a false teacher. A false teacher was once genuine and a true man of God. But something happened along the way and they went astray. And Revelation says they were either deceived or the, the, the dragon enticed them, so they fell. So somewhere along the line, they lost the position they had in God. And what could cause someone to lose their position in God? Deception. It could be that there was some lust in them that they didn't deal with and the enemy used that to take them out of their position. So those stars that the dragon drew from heaven and drew were men and women of God who lost their position but they still had influence. And because they had influence if you follow those people and you don't question, you don't know when they went astray and you continue to follow them, you follow them right to the Antichrist, right to hell. And that's why Paul said we are to become what? Berean Christian. You have to take accountability of your spiritual life. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, 13, verse 43. And see, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing shall be established. In Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, verse 43, this is Jesus speaking. He was talking about the parable of the tax. <coughs> He says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who had ears to hear, let him hear. So, the righteous shall shine forth as the sun. 
So the stars is a metaphor for believers who have attained certain ranking in the Lord. And you lead people to righteousness, you shine as stars. But if you do not do what Paul said, Paul said that he put his body under subjection so that after preaching he will not become what a castaway. See, the thing is, when you get to a certain level in God, pride becomes an issue. For some people, the biggest death they have to die is death of pride. And if God loves you so much, he will do what he did for Paul. He will put a thorn in your flesh so that he will keep you humble. Imagine if you had the knowledge that Paul had, and there is nothing to remind you that you're human. Because that's what it is. You get to a level in God where anything you say happens. You're working, you have authority, you can do whatever. You need something to remind you that you're human so that you remain humble. And so the Lord leaves a thorn in Paul's flesh to remind him that he's human so that it will keep him humble. And still the Berean church, they made sure that everything Paul taught, it was from the word of God. How much more us who are listening now when we are warned and told that there will be false teachers and false prophets, how much more are we to be careful who we listen to and to pay attention? No man or woman's word is has higher authority than the scripture. It doesn't matter how much you love that person or that individual. If you do that, then you set yourself up for, dece for deception. And then not having love of the truth is the last one. It says we're to love the truth regardless of how the truth presents itself. We're to love the truth. We're to hate evil. See, sin doesn't change. The packaging changes. The Word of God, you can package it to present it, but the Word of God doesn't change from age to age. It doesn't change. Sin doesn't change from age to age, but the devil packages it nicely so that it comes under a different name that is more socially and politically acceptable, but it's still the same thing. So we are to love the truth, be lovers of the truth. Amen. Then we moved on to areas of deception where we talked about Jesus says to watch out for false Christ. It's those who are anointed. They are false anointed. They are false prophets. But it's not just false prophets. You have false believers. You have false brethren. What's a false brethren? A false Christian, a false brethren, is someone that professes to be a Christian, but they lack the fruit. They profess they're your brother, they love the Lord, but they reject the Lord. They reject his sayings. You know what's so sad? Every now and then they do this uh, post in Christian uh, magazine where it's just uh, uh, they call this uh, how many the Christians, a, 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 a sort of young, young people, Christ, they say they're Christians, but they say they don't read the Bible or the Bible doesn't have a hold on them. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not the final authority, but they're Christians. So they're false believers. So you don't just have false prophets and false teachers and false apostles. You have false believers. And we all come in the name of Jesus. But we need to be careful so that we produce the fruits that we profess. We talked about what's in a name. A name according to Proverbs, says that a good name 
is better, Proverbs 22 verse 1, than riches. A good name, a good character, a good reputation. You know how much reputation is in the kingdom? That the devil will look for ways to ruin the reputation of a leading man or woman of God that the Lord is using. I, I, I read, I've heard about men of God who, like this uh, man of God I'm following in Nigeria, he, he said he went to minister in uh, a country in Africa and he went to his hotel. When he opened the hotel room, there was a lady in the hotel, his hotel room, ironing his coat. He's like, who are you? He said, I'm here, I'm assigned to take care of you. Say, are you uh, are you from the hotel? He said, No, I'm from the church. <laughs> the church assigned her to take care of him. So you don't know ways that the enemy tries to infiltrate. And then he, he left. He never entered the hotel room because that was a Jezebel assignment to destroy him. Because Jezebel is in the church. And he likes to be very close to authority. So, ministers need to watch out. And then there's stories where I had about I had this story where this man of God he was praying in his hotel room and there was a knock, and the Holy Spirit told him, "Don't open the door." And the knock kept coming. The Holy Spirit told him, don't open the door. Fortunately for him, there was a little see-through, you know, the little, yeah. And he, he looked through, and what he saw was a naked lady with just a towel. And so, it was a, a setup, so that immediately he opens the door, there were camera people with a camera. All they wanted to do was a snap a camera, a picture. He opens the door, they snap a camera. And then all they will see is, because the picture says a thousand words. Yeah. And thereby his reputation is ruined. And who would believe him anyways? Yeah. And so Satan looks for ways to destroy leading men and women of God in certain moves of God, thereby discrediting it. And when that happens, most of the time people will not believe you because the church will be the first to destroy you. Yeah. And what is God going to do? Reassign you because, yeah. And so, when we talk about reputation, character, the devil is looking for ways. It's very, and that is why Jesus sent them out two by two. Like one man of God said, he sent them out two by two. So that there is safety. I heard about uh, Billy Graham that Billy Graham, then he made a covenant with his guys. Whenever they travel, they must go to their hotel room together. They must never go alone because there must have been an incident where the enemy tried to infiltrate plant. So, but that's for genuine men and women of God who are sincerely trying to protect themselves because they know that the devil is looking for every opportunity to destroy what God is doing. But false prophets and false ministers are not the same. False prophets and false ministers come to take advantage of the sheep. Their main emphasis is their gain, what they can get from it. So, when people are always overly talking about finances or they focus on their anointings and their giftings, they put emphasis on themselves and not on the Lord. So the goal is not for Jesus to be glorified. The goal is for them to be glorified, to show that they are the real deal. False ministers emphasize here, I talked about it. False ministers, they are picky with scriptures. Now, there is a, a certain young prophet that I've been seeing on Facebook lately and many times he, 
each time he's going to prophesy, everyone say prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. You know, the emphasis is on prophesy. And then I, I, I saw some videos where he was talking about his uh, spiritual, whoever is his spiritual father, that he, he wants more than he wants Jesus. And then he says, tell me where scripture says, tell me the place in the scripture where it says that pray my to sex is a sin. See, they are very picky with scriptures. It's like the other uh, Muslim guy who was saying, tell me chapter and verse where Jesus said that he is Lord, then I will. See, they are very picky. But that's because they already made up their mind to be deceived and to deceive people. When you see, the Bible says, flee from immorality. If the Bible says flee from immorality, why are you looking for the chapter and verse that says that something is wrong, that is a sin? We have certain men of God who focus their whole entire ministry on one revelation. When people focus their entire ministry on one revelation, they run away from them. See, hyper grace. There are people, that's all they teach is grace. Right? But God is not just the God of grace. He's a God of judgment. He's holy. He's... Paul said that he taught the full... You know what's amazing? The person that they focus most on is the Apostle Paul, who had the revelation of grace, right? But Paul said that he taught the full counsel of God. So he didn't just focus on revelation of grace. He taught the full counsel. But now we have people whose ministry is all about grace. It's all about grace. And of course, we've learned from Reverend that people who do that is because they don't have a revelation of the righteousness and the justice system of God. So don't let you, when you see people who are fully of one revelation, that's all they talk about. There's something there you should stay away from. Amen. And then, if many false, and these people are like the guy I'm talking about, he does miracles. Miracles happen under his ministry. See, Jesus said in Matthew 7, you heal the sick, you did miracles, but depart from me, you workers of iniquity. See, workers of iniquity means that's what they, that's their lifestyle. It's not their job, it's their work is your identity. No, that sin is an identity. A sinner is an identity. But you're no longer a sinner once you're saved. So you cannot see yourself as a sinner anymore after you've been saved. Now your new identity is your righteousness. Your righteous. If false ministers operate with spiritual power, they false because the origin of that power is not from the Lord. What makes a false prophet is the spirit behind it. And just like a true, a true man of God that's operating anointing in healing and miracle have to maintain a consecration to maintain that lifestyle. The same way the consecration of the false ministers maintain. I had a, this is a true story of some men of God that are, they have been following. Go and sit down, Daniel and Rebecca. They have big following. And one of my mentors was telling me that these men of God, someone came for them for, to be covered under them. And the, the person is a female who is married, but this man of God was asking them to sleep, they wanted to sleep with her. So you have men of God who are living an immoral lifestyle, quote unquote men of God, but they live an immoral lifestyle. Because if you receive something from the devil, you need to maintain it by sacrifices. 
which is why one of the things we don't realize about the LGBTQ lifestyle is that, see, sex is powerful because it's a representation of our union with the Lord. The reason why abortion and all those illegal things is because they empower the devil. Witchcraft, all those things empower the devil. So when people engage in that, they strengthen them, their strength their, from the dark side. So when you have false ministers, false prophets, they have to do something to keep maintaining that. Just like a true prophet, a true man of God or woman of God needs to live a consecrated lifestyle. You see that they're fasting, they're worshiping, they're doing something to maintain that lifestyle. If not, they will dry. The same one, the other side. And many people have been destroyed because of that. Because they've been taking prey, they've become preyed on. So, if anybody, now, here's the thing most people don't understand about prophecy. See, there's so much prophetic witchcraft in the Christian circle. Whenever someone is giving you prophecy, and you feel any way pressured, know you're dealing with witchcraft. If someone is in the name of prophecy, is, is pressuring you, or you're feeling pressured to do anything, it's no longer prophecy, you're under witchcraft. And there's much, many of that in the Christendom. We call it prophetic witchcraft. We experienced this, me and my wife, early on in our, although this was through, now, we have to differentiate someone that has a certain personality versus a spirit. Eventually it becomes that if they don't repent. But you see, the thing about prophecy is, if your heart, your soul is not clean, it's not pure. Let me uh, say this before I say that, let me give you an example. See, if you look at prison light, it's, it's one strand of light that hits a prison. But when he hits that prison, it's pressed into different colors, right? But it's one light. When God speaks to you, God doesn't speak to your soul. God speaks to your spirit. And when God speaks, it comes as light. A revelation is a particle of light from the Lord. But what happens is when he hits your spirit, it's intact. The problem is when it goes from your spirit to your soul, that's where the problem is. Because if your soul is unclean, when it comes to your soul, that message becomes diluted based on what's in your soul. Now, if your soul is full of immorality, that message now needs to be filtered through a prism of immorality. So when it comes out, it's no longer pure. It's like a woman, Joyce Meyer, I've said because she, she talked about this, she was abused by her own dad, sexually. And so imagine if she was receiving a message from the Lord about her dad, it will go through her experience. And when it comes out, she will release it based on her experience. But if her soul was clean and pure, before this is before she was healed, then that message will be transmitted through that. So many times what happens is some people get a message from the Lord, but because of what's in their heart, that message becomes diluted. And that's where the problem is, is that a major part of the prophetic is your soul. Reverend talked about this at PPC. How clean is your soul? Because if you have a need, it's like a guy that saw a girl 
and wants to get married and now loves to fall in love and is asking the Lord, is this what you want me to marry? Everything he receives will be saying yes, because that's the lust in their heart. It won't be from what the Lord is saying. And so, we need to pay attention because many times people prophesy out of the lust of their heart in the name of prophecy. And this person had a need and they prophesied to us that the Lord says it's easy for us to leave our church and to come to their church. But like, ah, something is wrong with that prophecy. That's not from God. Because if God wants me to leave my church, first of all, I must have a witness. And if God wants me to leave my church, He won't just tell me to leave my church and come to your church. Right? So, there was a lot of pressure. So, whenever you're receiving any prophetic word from anybody and you feel pressure, compelled to do something, it's not just in prophecy. It's when you're about to give and you feel compelled to give, know that you're dealing with witchcraft. You should. You shouldn't give being forced. You should give cheerfully. See, if the Lord, the Lord wants everybody to repent and not go to hell, but it has to be by your own free will. If the Lord cannot override your free will for you not to go to hell, and because of prophecy, someone overrides your free will. See, that's demonic. So, whenever you feel compelled, know that you're not you're dealing with something. And there are many people who will tell you many information about yourself in order to gain your confidence by telling you word of knowledge about your past or your name. Why do you need that? See, we should come to a point <coughs> where we're no longer fascinated that someone is, God is using someone to do miracles. You should come to a point where you thank God for that. But don't treat that man or woman of God any different because the Lord is using them to do miracles. Because many people say it's a mighty man of God, a woman of God is doing miracles, and that's all they see. And they, because of that, they overlook everything else. Hallelujah. So pay attention. Watch, pay attention. I had them, one of my friends. Whenever this is funny, we went to listen to a man of God that I, I know the man of God. And the whole time he had this look. He was like sizing him up. He was, he didn't, and then at the end he told me, okay, this is a man of God. I'm like, why? Because I was judging what he was saying. See, he was judging him and that's how we should be. You shouldn't just let receive it. Now, if you know someone is a man of God, yeah, but if you don't pay attention to what people are saying, because false prophet will minimize the word of God. If God's word is not authority in anything, then move away. No man has authority more than the word of God. If not, you'll be deceived. And then, of course, false prophets, false ministers, many of them will engage in extra biblical practices. They will teach Things, do example, examples of, of things that are not biblical. You know, there are things the Lord will tell you to do that it's not, there's, you can't find the example, but that shouldn't be a doctrine. When that becomes a doctrine, then you're running into problems. And so we should be careful about that. See, there are many, we, many things around us is witchcraft, but we don't pay attention. You say, open the newspaper, you see all the zodiac signs. See, that's witchcraft. We should stay away from all those things. You have people who read card or look at your hand, your palm, and read your palm. Those are manifestations of witchcraft. We have people like this guy who was talking about the third eye. There's only Jesus. The only way into the spirit realm is through Jesus. Yeah. If someone is telling you about the third eye and anything else, stay away. Because there are people who are talking about that and they call themselves prophet. And the certain is they have huge following. 
because they prophesy and do miracles, people call them men and women of God. Be careful. Amen. Now, I have, okay, almost, I, 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 I'm going, I'm not, I'll, I'll mention this, then I'll elaborate on it next time. That's in the church. Now in politics, see, Jesus talked about, I said, this whole thing is about deception. Now, if you look at Mark chapter 13, where we, where we looked at from verse 7, Jesus was talking about what shifted now to size in the political realm. It says, and when you shall hear of wars and rumors of war, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Eight, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. See? When, I, when we talk about this, you will see that we've been living this. All the movements in America is a manifestation of this. All the justice movement, the racial equity movement, all the uh, uh, green, uh, 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 what, what is it called? The green movement, environmentalist movement. What's, uh, what's the name for it now? I'm blanking out on the name for it now. You don't believe in, um, they'll say you don't believe in um, uh, climate change. See? All those things are a manifestation of this. Because it's signs that the Lord is showing, but in the political realm, those signs now are given a name and are used for a political agenda. And we fall right in line because we are not reading the sign correctly and paying attention to it. This is huge, but we'll pick up on it because it is deception in different arena. And when you begin to notice this, you begin to pay attention, what it will make you is to take a step backwards and say, when everybody is moving in one direction, take a step backwards. I say, why is everybody moving in this direction? What is the force behind this movement? Because the Bible says that the prince of the air rules. He rules by ideas. Who is propagating this idea that's galvanizing the whole nation? And it's a sign of the last days deception in every area and we can talk, focus on that next week so that we can win ourselves and remove ourselves from tactics of the enemy that's already deceiving men in the church and they don't even know it because we bought it line who can sink her and we can't tell the difference but Jesus says come out of her if we are to come out of her, that means we have to come, we have to recognize everything that belongs to Babylon and how Babylon is manifested and then come out of her in all these ideas and manifestations. Amen. Any question? I know this will be a big one because it will, it will hit on many people, many things that, that we've been witnessing. Like I said, deception, just like the false prophet. When you see overemphasis on one thing, pay attention. I've come to realize that the Lord Jesus is balanced. Balanced. Paul says he taught the whole counsel of God. That means Paul was biblically balanced. He was not overly into one thing. He was balanced. 
the kingdom of God, the throne of God is established in righteousness and justice. There is a balance. And we have to be balanced. When we see ourselves being swayed to one thing all the time, or being enticed, we should take a step backwards and look for the balance. Just like if you're, if you're a parent, you're going to discipline your child, something I'm learning, you need to be balanced. There is a place for discipline, but there's a place for love. So that discipline is balanced with love. The correction is balanced with love. If not, it becomes a sin on your part as a parent. So everything God does, there is a balance to it. Amen. Any question? I don't suppose you would tell us what false prophet you've been listening to or in fact to listen to. Hmm? I don't suppose you would tell us what false prophet you were listening to. You know, the thing is, uh, I mean, there's so many out there. There's so many, but I can say a name, but that's why I try to, I try to, uh, I learn something from my mentors, you know, you try to say what they say by not calling them by their name. It, you know, maybe sometimes then you can call them by their name, because Paul called them by their names. Right? So, but, yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't want to be calling people's names. But I can say what they say, and then you can use that. Right. Any question? Well, let's. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Right back in the beginning, you said you mentioned the sign of the last days is deception, and then right under that, it was to deceive is to cause. It's to cause, and I missed what was the part of that. It's to cause someone to depart from the truth. Is to cause someone to leave from the, to one day away from the truth. Yeah, anything that causes you to stray from the truth. You know, one thing that um, this is this time where to know the word of God. If you've never read through the scriptures, I know Reverend has said if you read one. How many pages every day? Four pages. I would encourage you to read through the scriptures. Because if you read through this, the entire scripture, even if you read through it once, when you come across something, you may not know where it is, but you remember the Holy Spirit will bring it. See? You only make withdrawal after you've made a deposit. Daniel, you cannot make a withdrawal if you don't make a deposit. So you have to deposit something that the Holy Spirit can work with so that when you need it, you will make a withdrawal. If you don't fill yourself with the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will have nothing to work with when you come across something that is false. I know you've, you've gone through this where all of a sudden certain scriptures come to your mind. And you may not remember where they were, but you, you know because you've read it. That's how it works. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance. So when you go through situations, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance certain scriptures. But you need to first of all read the Bible so you know that it's a scripture instead. I know someone used to tell me, God helps people who help themselves. And it sounded so biblical. I was like, you know, something is wrong. God helps people who help themselves. 